Welcome to Critical Aspects of Law Enforcement, a podcast where we dive into the physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual well-being of the law enforcement officer. Welcome back to Critical Aspects of Law Enforcement. I'm your host, Vernon Phillips. And today with us, we've got uh, Lieutenant Randy. So, Lieutenant, why don't you just uh, jump right in, go ahead and give us a little bit of back- background about yourself, um, you know, kind of just your history in law enforcement, your career, you know, education, things like that. Okay, sounds good. So, my name is Lieutenant Randy Sutton. I am a retired uh, Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department Lieutenant. I did a total of 34 years in law enforcement. I began my career in the small community of Princeton, New Jersey. And I was a police officer there for 10 years. And it was a small town, 30 officer police department. And quite honestly, I got bored. And uh, it was my hometown and it just wasn't doing it for me. And I, I just craved action. So I, halfway through my career, I, uh, I began my career all over again and tested for the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department and, uh, and joined the, the department. I had to start my career all over again. I had to go back through the academy, back through field training. And, uh, and then I spent um, 24 years with the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department, and I did a variety of assignments. Of course, I started back out on patrol. Then I did a short stint in the vice section. Then I was a field training officer for uh, quite a while. And then I was a narcotics detective and um, went from there. I got promoted to sergeant. And I spent a lot of time, I think I was a sergeant for pretty close to uh, to 12 years. That was my favorite job on the department. And then tested for lieutenant, made lieutenant, and spent my entire my entire lieutenant's career on the graveyard shift uh, because in Vegas, that's where the action is. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I retired uh, at, at the rank of lieutenant. And along my career path, I did a lot of other things other than just be a cop. Um, I've written a number of books. Um, my first book, which uh, uh, I, I never intended to be an author. Let me put it that, that way. But what happened was, as with you know most police officers, you have some life-altering experiences, and I had I had uh, several of those life-altering experiences, and one of them was um, the uh, I was on patrol as a as a sergeant, and um, one evening right off the Las Vegas Strip, I come upon a car. It's up on the sidewalk. People are running around screaming, and I don't know what the issue is. But of course, you know, I I bail out of the car and I radio for a backup on an un, unknown trouble. And it was it was a, it was a scene that was bedlam. There's people running around screaming. There's I, when I get up closer, there's bullet holes in the car. What had happened was mom and dad, young mother mother and father, um were driving down the street, minding their own business. This is in the evening. And uh, they have a one-month-old baby in, a, in, a, in an infant seat in the car. And these uh, gangbangers pulled up alongside of them. We later found out in a gang initiation and just opened fire on the car indiscriminately. Yes. So then it happened literally minutes before I got there. Well, somebody screamed, oh, my God, the baby's been shot. And I looked down and in the, in the infant seat, there's this one month old baby and she'd been shot in the face. And of course, the protocol is that you, you know, call for an ambulance and wait for medical to get there. But I realized that this baby is going to die unless I get her to the hospital, you know, right now. So the first unit that got there, I scooped the baby up. Um, when the bullet hit her face, all the blood and tissue went down into her throat and choked her. And I was mm. able to clear her airway and give her mouth to mouth resuscitation and bring her back. And because I was there so quickly after the incident happened, she didn't suffer any brain damage. And, oh, wow. uh, and it was, it was, a, it was a life changing experience for me. 
And uh, yeah, I can night, imagine. That night, I, I, I felt like I had to write the story. I, I didn't have anything to do with the story. I just, you know, it's one of those things that, you know, I, it was like a catharsis, you know? Oh, yeah. So me and a bottle of Johnny Walker Black um, and a pen and a yellow, pa- yellow pad of paper, uh, I wrote the story called Her Name Was Jackie. And like I said, I didn't have anything to do with the story. I just had to write it. So I stuck it in a drawer. And uh, this was 1998. Well, when the World Trade Center was attacked on September 11th, 2001, I was very frustrated not being able to help those officers out. And then I recalled that story that was in that drawer. And I thought to myself, you know, every cop I know has a story like this. I'm going to ask them to write that story for me. And I'm going to put it in a book. And I'm going to donate all the royalties to the Widows and Orphans Fund for the cops who were killed at the World Trade Center. And that's exactly what I did. And that book um, uh, was True Blue, Police Stories by Those Who Have Lived Them. And I, uh, I raised a substantial amount of money for those officers' families. And uh, that began my writing career. Um, so you, you, I can I can go on and on, but... <laughs> So oh, I'm you, sure you can. <laughs> but uh, do you do you want me to fast forward to the end of my career? Uh, yeah, I I, I want to get into that, but I also I, I kind of want to unpack a little bit of that um, before we kind of move on. Okay. Uh, cause I, cause I think there's some good good teaching elements in there for for other people. Um, so after that event, I mean, because usually. Um, Cause I hear it from, from different people. Some people are like, Hey, I like it when other people share like some of their worst experiences. Cause it helps me realize and understand that like, I'm not the only one that's dealt with some really, really crappy things. Um, and then I hear from some other people that are like, Oh, you know, you know, we all hate that question, right? Like what's the worst call you've ever been? I said, I get it. I understand that. But you know, the purpose behind, you know, talking about it is cause it gives other people the opportunity to then maybe kind of express some of those critical and traumatic events they've been through and then maybe help them kind of work through some of that 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 trauma that they've been pushing down and not wanting to deal with. But so it sounds like so you went home that night, right? And you wrote out the whole entire the whole entire thing, right? Right. That's exactly what I did. So that that in and of itself is very therapeutic because what you're doing is you know you didn't you didn't take that and, and at, for the moment and push it down inside, right, and just stuff it down. I mean, you went home and you wrote it all out. So you actually had to express it, right? You had to put it, all the things that you were feeling, all the thoughts, all the things you went through, you had to take that and you had to put pen to paper and write out all those, you know, emotions and all the details. And that probably was very therapeutic for you. It was, it was indeed. I mean, it literally, I felt compelled to write that story and that, because it was, you know, we go through our police careers and very often we're touched by a lot of different things that we see, that we do, that we, you know, that, that affect us in either positive or negative ways. And this was, you know, it was a, it was a tragic, it was a tragic crime that a little baby could be shot indiscriminately. Mm-hmm. And that baby, um, you know, uh, would have lost her life had it not been, had I not been put in that position. And I'm not a, I I don't really believe in fate. I believe that things happen for a reason. And the fact that I just happened to be on that street at that moment, that was something that, that um, was a, was a, a life. It was literally a life changing moment for me. And um, absolutely. And when one that 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 has reverberated all these years, I'm still in touch with her. Um, in fact, I've, I'm involved with her family. Um, her cousin grew up listening, knowing knowing the story about her. And when he was old enough, she called me and said, "Hey, my cousin wants to become a metro police officer." And I. I uh, was able to help him and mentor him. And um, I literally just saw him. He's now testing for sergeant. So 
you know, it's really. Yeah, that's awesome. It's just an awesome story. I mean, obviously the event itself wasn't particularly awesome. I mean, I don't think anybody will say, you know, that was an awesome experience, but like you said, it was a life changing experience and look at, look at the outcome and look at the ripple effect that it's had. Uh, you, you, and also you being able to talk about it and share it. Absolutely. And, and um, so that I'm going to tell you two of the major stories that, that affected my career. That was one of them. And that had a happy ending. The first one did not have a happy ending. Well, depends on how you view it, I guess. But so I came to Vegas because I wanted action. And, you know, it's like the old adage, be careful what you wish for, right? And I wasn't off probation. As, as a cop in New Jersey, in Princeton, I never used my weapon for anything other than going to the range. But I wasn't even off probation before I was in my first shooting here in Vegas. Um, I was, uh, I was on patrol with my partner in, uh, an area of the, of the town that, that was, uh, inf infested with gangs. And, um, I, I went to stop a stolen car and the vehicle took off. We got in pursuit. I was driving the vehicle crashed. Driver bailed out, passenger bailed out. I went after the driver. And it's like two o'clock in the morning, two thirty in the morning. We're in a low-income housing development. I'm running and running. I was younger then. I could st I could still run then. <laughs> and uh, I was right on his. I, you know, I was right behind him, but I couldn't quite catch up to him. Um, he went around the corner of a building, and I had my gun in my hand, of course. And as I came around the corner, he was waiting for me to shoot me. And I came around the corner, and he was pointing the gun at me. And I popped a, a, a round off and the round missed him by about a quarter of an inch, missed his ear. But it, he was standing right in front of a building. And when the bullet hit the building right behind him, a piece of the building material broke off and hit him in the head. Oh, so man. he thought he was shot. <laughs> and he couldn't throw <laughs> that gun away fast enough. Well, it turned out he was 15 years old. Oh, yeah. And uh, thank God I didn't kill him. But it was, it was, here's your reality check, Randy. You know, you, you wanted more action. Well, you're not in Kansas anymore, Toto. Yeah. And, uh, and that, 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 that was a, that was a real wake up moment for me on, you know, the fragility of life. And, you know, they, they could have gone an entirely different way. So that was my first shooting. A um, couple of years go by, I am a field training officer and my trainee was off sick on this particular night. So I'm having dinner with my old partner and uh, it's nine o'clock on a Saturday night and we're walking out of the restaurant when uh, the radio tone alert went off and, um, and a, you know, it was a, a uh, an alert for a crime in progress. Well, it was what we now know as an active shooter. And the report was there was a guy dressed all in black, had bandoliers of ammunition draped around his body. He had a shoulder holster with a pistol and he had a sword and he was shooting at kids at a high school dance. Mm -hmm. And it was literally only two blocks from where we were having dinner. And at first I thought, this is, this sounds so bizarre. I'm not sure that I'm buying it, but within seconds we knew it was the real deal because there were two couples on a double date following the guy and they're on the phone with 911. Okay. He's shooting at the kids again. They're diving for cover. Well, the suspect realized he's being followed by this car and he turned around and he fired around through the windshield and the bullet went between the heads of the two couples. Well, the driver decided, you know what, I think I've done my civic duty and he took off and within literally within, you know, less than two minutes, I was there. And as I got there, as I pulled onto the street, I saw another patrol car getting there with a, a field training officer and his trainee and they jump out of the car. They're using their car doors for cover and the suspect is walking directly towards them. 
And he's dressed exactly like the report said. He's got the gun in his hand. And he's nonchalantly walking right towards this police car. And they're using their car doors for cover. I can't hear what they're saying, but I know they're screaming, drop the gun, drop the gun, get on the ground. And I'm expecting in these seconds that I'm that I am observing this as I'm pulling up, that A, they're going to shoot the guy. B, he's going to run. C, he's going to surrender. D, he's going to shoot himself. So I'm preparing myself for all of these possibilities as I'm pulling up to the scene. But he does something that nobody expects. He literally nonchalantly walks towards this police car, holsters his pistol in his shoulder holster, and the two cops are like, well, hell, what do we do now? And he just literally walked right by him, gave him a little nod, and walked past him. Now, I've, I'm out of my car. Huh. And he starts walking up the driveway to an apartment complex, and there's a bunch of people who are watching this, right? And they're up at the end of the street, up at the end of the apartment complex driveway. Well, I can't let him get to those people. But... And literally, this is the moment that I've trained for my entire police life, right? The decision to use deadly force. But that decision isn't just a professional decision. It's yeah. a very personal decision. Yep. Because you're going to live with the consequences of that for the rest of my life. And I didn't want to shoot him in the back. Was I legally justified? Of course I was. But... I didn't want to shoot him in the back. So I ran up behind him and I had my gun in my hand. And at the last minute he heard me and he turned to face me. And when he did, I gave him like a flying sidekick to the stomach. And I thought maybe my mighty blow would, you know, put him down, but it didn't work like that. And when I kicked him, he kind of went over and then came up with the gun. And we were literally inches away from each other. Our gun muzzles were almost touching each other. And we both fired at exactly the same time. And I fired two rounds. Oh, by the way, I wasn't wearing my vest. And I fired two rounds and then the nightmare that we all have actually happened to me. My gun jammed. Oh, now man. I'm going click, 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 and he's going boom, boom, boom. And I remember those muzzle flashes looking like they're a flamethrower, you know? And I remember thinking, this is what it's going to be like to die. I got no cover. My gun's not working. Well, you do what you got to do when you're in a, when you're in a, in a situation like that. I rolled down onto my back and I was trying to clear my gun to get it working. And I'm twisting from side to side as he's trying to shoot me. And he's trying to shoot me little pieces of asphalt are breaking off and hitting me. And I remember thinking, is that the one? Is that the one? What's it going to feel like? And my old partner, so the, our, our air unit had gotten above us. And they saw the muzzle flash from him and saw me go down. So they radioed, shots fired, officer down. Remember those two cops who were there at the beginning? Well, they see me go down and they figure now's a good time to shoot at this guy. So now their bullets are zinging over my head too. He's trying to shoot me. The rotor wash from the helicopter, all is blowing up rocks and sticks. And, and it's just, it is, it is, it's bedlam. Oh man. And he's trying to shoot me. Well, my little partner drove in and tried to run him over with his car. But what happens in a critical incident, you, you, you know, you, there are physiological things like tunnel vision, auditory shutdown, things like that. So he didn't see these big cement stanchions that were in his way. So he, he, his patrol car, he, he, was, he was aiming at the suspect, but he hit these big cement pylons instead, and it sounded like an explosion. So it didn't have the effect that he wanted to, but it took the suspect's attention away from me long enough to get up and re-engage him, now I've got my gun working. And we're literally in a toe-to-toe -to -toe gunfight. You know, just inches apart from one another. And I empty my magazine, and he's still standing there. 
And I remember thinking, I'm the world's worst freaking shot. I reload. He goes running around the corner. I go running after him. My old partner goes running after him. And he goes around the corner. He's hiding behind a bush. And I hear him scream, die, motherfucker, die. I just emptied my gun. I ended the gunfight. And uh, at the end of the day, my first two rounds were fatal shots. He just didn't know it because it's not like TV. He was still very, very much a threat, even though he was fatally shot. At the end of the day, he had 43 gunshot wounds. Golly. And uh, he wasn't a big guy. He was only like five foot six, 150 pounds. But it's not like television. You know, so many people get their get their information, even police officers. They expect certain things to happen when they're in a shooting. You know, my first shot didn't throw him up against the wall like, you know, you see on TV or movies. Yeah. That bullet went through him. You know, devastated his insides, but he was pumped up on adrenaline. And he was still very much a threat. So that ended uh, that ended his life. And I was not touched by one bullet during the entire encounter. Yeah, that's incredible. So that was a, another life-changing moment for me. And, you know, we, all, we, we hear about post-traumatic stress injury, post-traumatic stress disorder. But there's something that is rarely talked about and yet is is an important part of the equation, and that's post-traumatic stress growth. Yep. I mean, I, I fully believe that I became a better police officer, that I became a better human being based on this terrible encounter. Because what it did, it made me it made me think it created what I call my journey of why. The journey of why did I survive and he not? And I believe that I came up with the, with the answer to that. And I didn't die that night because I had not fulfilled whatever mission I was put here for. And of course, then that goes into the next part of your life, right? Well, okay, Randy. Yeah. What is your mission? And I believe that, you know, that's part of what, why I created the Wounded Blue, that I was kept here on this earth to do something that would have a serious impact on my brothers and sisters. So as, as painful as that moment was, and I believe me, I, I think about that, that moment regularly. But not all, you know, critical incidents lead to trauma. Not to say that I didn't have my ghosts. Yeah. Yeah. You know, a lot of it has to do with the way that you process those critical incidents, traumatic events that you've gone through. Um you know, the way that you, you follow up with those, the way that, you know, you, you decompress and, and defuse and debrief from those and actually talk through those and walk through those things. That has a lot to do with the, you know, the long-term effects that it has. Um, because, you know, when, when you do suffer PTSD and, you know, and you do suffer trauma, you know, there absolutely is post-traumatic growth, right? And that comes out of the healing process from those events, right? From that trauma. And you know, so when you put that into practice and then you start to instill that into your life, right, it, it builds that resiliency and then also gives you the ability, like you, Lieutenant, to come on here and talk about your events because it's I'm sure even still it's not easy to talk about these events, right? To to lay them out, to to go through them in detail, but you understand that hey, this is what happened to me and 
at the end of the day, I can't sit here and tell you why, you know, he fires and, and all the shots he took at me that I didn't take any rounds and that, you know, we put 43 rounds into him. He dies. I don't die, but I can tell you what I am going to do. I'm going to repurpose my life so that others know and understand, Hey, you may have gone through some type of critical incident, traumatic event. You might be dealing with trauma. You may, you know, have the demons that you're struggling with, but you don't have to stay in that stagnant place that you're at, right? In that stuck place that you're at. You don't have to stay there, right? You can push forward, you can grow, and you can and you can you can recover from that, and you can still have a successful career and a successful life. So I think a lot of times what happens is, you know, we internalize it, right? We don't talk about it for fear of the stigma, for fear that, hey, they're gonna, you know, they're gonna ground us, they're gonna take our gun, they're gonna put us at a desk, they're gonna uh, all I know is to be a cop. What what do I do when it's all gone? But when we kind of get past this and we start to change this, you know, it gives you the opportunity to actually walk through some of this stuff and then be able to in turn do what you're doing and say, Hey, let me help other people that have done this. And let's, let's take some of the stuff we've gone through and actually put it to good use rather than allow it to destroy people's careers. Let's talk about this stuff. Let's round table this stuff and allow it to help people not only survive their career, but thrive in their career. So I think what you're doing and you're being willing to talk about it is a huge thing. So I'm going to give you a little a little aside on this. So my partner and I, after after that particular night, we of course after we do what what we used to do back in those days, you, we went out drinking afterwards. Yep. And uh, and uh, but after that that night, he and I never talked about it again for years. Literally for years. Well, one evening we're, we go out drinking again and uh, we're at this bar and, you know, there's a, a mirror behind behind the bar. And I don't know why it came up, but we started talking about it again. And it was, you know, like I said, we had never even addressed it. Um, he shot the guy too. So it was both of us. So we're... We're rehashing it now. And I said, how about that crazy son of a bitch screaming, die, motherfucker, die. And and he didn't say anything. And he just looked at, he was looking at me in the mirror. And I was, it was weird he didn't say anything. And I turned to look at him. I said, what? And he says, you really don't know, do you? And I said, no, what? He said, he never said a word. That was you. Wow. Now, let me ask you a question. This was, of course, way before body cams were invented. What do you think would happen to me now if while I'm screaming, die, motherfucker, die, I'm shooting this guy? You think, oh, I'm, you think I'm not going to prison? Oh, the press would have a field day with that. And... This is why it's so important that we that we talk about things like this because police combat is just that combat. You're you're amped up at a, a thousand percent, full of adrenaline, full of fear, full of of you know the wonderment of, am I going to survive this? And so your body reacts and, and you do things that, I mean, look at the, I, I had no idea that I said that, but now what we're doing is we're taking what happens in the heat of battle. And that's what it is. It's a battle. Mm -hmm. And then we're holding these officers accountable for what happens during the heat of battle and holding, holding them accountable in ways that, that are, that are unfair and and very very misunderstood and that's why it is so critical that police agencies understand this and instead of instead of developing the you know we're going to burn this guy down because of of what we heard on the body cam understand this and that's it's a it's a really um it's a critical critical issue 
that that all cops that are that are faced with these type of situations are are um, are threatened with. Yeah, absolutely. And the thing is, you know, you, so you're going through that and then explaining that it's like there's this idea that law enforcement officers, right, that when they when they become a cop and when you go out and you do your job, that all of the things that you see, all the things you do, that you encounter, that you no longer have any type of human emotion anymore, right? Yeah, obviously, you know, you're trained to to handle the situation and you're going to do just that, right? You're going to respond. And as soon as something goes on, you're going to re- revert right back to your training. So that's why it's important you train effectively and efficiently. And without, you know, you, you can have fun training, but, you know, when you're joking around and, and you're doing all that that crap, that also plays into when it actually, when stuff hits the fan and you got to respond. Right. But you're going to fall back on that training. But that doesn't say that you're not going to have some type of emotional response like any other normal human being would. So, oh, boy, just got done trying to kill you. So it is a natural emotional response. Right. When you actually get the opportunity and you're back in the game and, and you've done what you need to do for your weapon and you come around the corner and, yeah, he's there, but he's already engaged you. and He's already tried to kill you. To take all that aside, any any well, I say any reasonable any reasonable person, but we have a lot of unreasonable people out there today, right? <laughs> yes, we but do. Most others, especially in this profession, would look at that and be like, "Yeah, absolutely, your emotional response is is warranted, right?" I mean, that's the the, the what you said. He just tried to kill you, and he's been trying to kill other people, and. He probably are. How many? Was there any other casualties that night other than him? No. Nope. Oh, so just him. But it still didn't change the fact that he was set and he had the intent to take life that night. And Absol- absolutely. That going off of what you're saying and the fact that he engaged you all the way he did, he had no, no desire to give up or to to stop whatever his intent was. So. We have this idea that, that we're not going to have emotion, right? That, and I understand that sometimes you got to pack that away. You got to stow that to get through whatever the situation is in front of you. But after the fact, it's okay to be like, holy crap, that was, what the heck was that? Right? So emotional responses are just that. They're emotional responses. They're, and sometimes we don't have control over how our body is going to process whatever event we're going through. So, I say at the end of the day, man, what you walk through as a hard, hard deal. And just like you said earlier that, you know, on the earlier on the first one, you know, you're making that decision. Oh man. Okay. Am I, you know, you were saying, am I justified? Yeah. But being justified and then actually being justified with yourself. Yeah. Those those are exactly right. Those are two different things. Right. So you may come out of it and everything is is across the board. Everything is right. Justified. Boom. Nothing. But that doesn't mean that it did not impact you. Right. Didn't mean that it didn't scar you morally. I mean, that's why we have moral injury. Right. Because at the end of the day, nobody in law enforcement is in law enforcement because they want to take a life. Right. Right. That is not that's not why you get into because if you're getting in law enforcement, you're wanting to serve and you want to protect. Right. So you don't get into it because you want to take life. So when that does happen, whether or not it's justified, whether or not it was what you need to do at the end of the day, it still transgresses the morally held belief that taking another life is is wrong. Right. But it doesn't it doesn't make it any less impactful when you look at it and you're like, man, you know what? It's either me or him or it's either me and somebody else. It doesn't change. It doesn't change how it affects us. So let, I, I know that we 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 we've got a time limit here. So I want to I want to push right. forward. Let's come on, man. Let's go. Send it. In, so <laughs> now I want to push forward to the end of my career. I did not intend to retire when I did, but I suffered a stroke in my police car, mm. and that's what ended my police career. And it was the most it was the most frightening moment of my life. I'm on patrol, 
It's 2.30 in the morning. I'm on the Las Vegas Strip. I had a young police officer with me because I was the watch commander. Whenever I was watch commander, I would take a young cop with me so I'd get to know my folks. We're driving down the street, and I'm talking to him like I'm talking to you, and suddenly I found myself talking slower. And I literally felt my brain slowing down. And I knew what was happening. I stopped the police car and I said, get me medical. I'm having a stroke. And the kid's looking at me like, is this the way the lieutenant messes with me, right? And I got out of the car to go around to the passenger side in case he needed to get me to the hospital. I started speaking gibberish. And I knew I was speaking gibberish. I just couldn't control it. And then I lost the ability to speak. I lost the ability to move. And I crumpled to the pavement. And that's where my police career ended on a dirty gutter surrounded by tourists who were taking my picture. Oh, I'm laying man. there helpless. And then what happened after that was, uh, was um, incredible to me. My own department turned its back on me. I said, we're not paying your medical bills. We're not going to give you your benefits. And I was just shocked. I said, what, what do you, you have to. It's the law. Well, yeah, but make, it, make us. A department that I had served for 24 years, that I'd almost given my life for on more than one occasion, turned its back on me. And that feeling of betrayal, that feeling of aloneness, was devastating to me. Three weeks before I had the stroke, my mother died in my arms. Two months before that, I was involved in another fatal shooting. So there was a lot going on. And then when I suddenly don't have my police career anymore, it's all that loss, that, that you know, identity that we always, that we have, you know, identifying ourselves as a police officer suddenly... That's taken from me. My own department turned his back. I went to go see the sheriff who I'd served with for 24 years. And I said, how do you treat me like this? And he looked at me dead in the eyes. Randy, this isn't personal. It's just business. And I came to find out that that's exactly what it was. So I had to get a lawyer. I had to fight him. They spent tens of thousands of dollars of taxpayers' money to fight me. And they knew it would take about a year or so. And they were hoping I would die in the meantime. I, I beat him, but I'll never forget that feeling. Well, after that happened, I thought I was the Lone Ranger. But suddenly I find myself being contacted by cops from around the country. They'd seen me on yep. the TV show Cops. They'd read my books. They'd seen me in the movies. And just because they knew who I was, they're reaching out to me with these terrible stories. Randy, I was... Shot in the line of duty. My chief never came to visit me in the hospital. They've thrown me away. They're not paying my medical bills. Randy, I was hit by a car. Um, they've just abandoned me. Well, I mean, one terrible story after another, always ending with I feel forgotten. I feel alone. And I, and I couldn't do anything for them. And they're just reaching out to me only because I was visible in the law enforcement community. And I was looking for resources. For them, and I found that there was no national resource. Well, there sure as hell is now, and that is the Wounded Blue, and we are the national assistance and support organization for injured and disabled law enforcement officers, and we are saving lives. Our motto is never forgotten, never alone, and we live by that. My Absolutely. team is made up of of more than fifty cops from all over the country. Everybody has been shot, or stabbed, or beaten, or run over, or faced serious pub, uh, post-traumatic stress and come out on the other side. And we have touched the lives of more than 14,000 law enforcement officers in the last five years. Man, that's, that a, that's incredible. Is the most important thing that I've ever done in my life. And that is my mission now. Yeah, that is your, that is your purpose now. So why don't you tell us a little bit more about, you know, the wounded blue. Why don't you tell us, um, some more about that. So the, the Wounded Blue is a very unique organization. We're a resource for every cop in America. And we are a resource for every police agency in America, too. And what we provide is peer support. That's our main focus. 
And that's why the never forgotten, never alone is so is so critically important. Because mm-hmm. when you do get physically or psychologically injured, you think it's just you. You think you are alone. And and that journey is very, very lonely, lonely. So you don't have to walk it alone. There are people that just like us, they're all we're we're all trained, certified peer team counselors. It's, uh, everything is confidential. We help people get into treatment if they need treatment. If they need, if they're, if they got addiction issues, we help them get into into treatment for that. We've done some amazing things, and we've got something coming up I, that I'm really, really proud of. Um, September 26th to the 29th, we have created a training program called the National Law Enforcement Survival Summit. And it's going to be held here in Las Vegas, the 26th to the 29th of September. It's every aspect of surviving a law enforcement career. I've got some of the best instructors and presenters in the country, including Lieutenant Dave Grossman, Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman. Nice. Uh, Dave and Betsy Smith are coming. I've got, uh, I mean, I've got some of the most incredible speakers coming from all over the nation. And it's every aspect of surviving a law enforcement career, spiritually, financially, relationships. So for every cop, who is, who is listening to this or watching this, go to the woundedblue.org, see who we are, see what we do, and sign up for this summit. It is life-changing. It can be life-saving. Last year, we had a woman came up to me after the, after the, the conference and said, Randy, I had every intention of killing myself, but you've given me hope. Mm-hmm. And she's doing quite well now. So this literally is is critically important. You know th- th- that your mission here and what you're doing is bringing this information out. And so you know I'm I'm very honored to have the opportunity to share this with you and and your viewers and your audience. Um, you don't have to walk the journey alone. Go to thewoundedblue.org and reach out to us. Absolutely. And well, I'll put, uh, I'll put that in the show notes. Um, you know, I'll put uh, the address to your website and all that in there so that, uh, you know, if anybody's listening, wants to jump on your page or look at the summit that's coming up, um, they can get, they, they can go right to it, but absolutely. I mean, I think what you're doing is, is a very much needed and, you know, talking about, you know, what I do is I talk a lot about the physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual well-being of the law enforcement professional, right? That's what we want to talk about. We want to talk about all the areas that make up the whole person. Um, you know, cause a lot of times we talk about the physical or, or the mental, but we leave out some of the other, the, you know, the other aspects, but you know, when we, we want to talk about the whole person because, right. you know, the career doesn't just affect you physically, right. Or emotionally or mentally or spiritually. It affects you in all of those areas. So we need to be very, you know, conscious of that. We need to be putting things out and, teaching people how to survive and thrive in their careers. And just like you said, and that's, you know, that's one of the things I believe that why we still have, you know, suicides and law enforcement in their careers, because for, for two reasons, I feel that one is that they feel like they're all alone. Just like you said, they feel like they're all alone. They're the only ones dealing with this. And the other one is, is because the devil's a liar and he will capitalize on your hopelessness and your despair and, He's just, he's just a plain old liar. So, but this idea that, that they, that they are by themselves is, is not true, but it's because of the stigma that's been created throughout the, you know, the last several decades that if you talk about this, if you, you know, if you say anything that, that even makes a mention that you, you know, you're weak or you're incapable of this job, man, you're done, you're out. Right. And that's not true. It's you're having a normal response to an abnormal situation what's different is with law enforcement first responders is those abnormal situations that would be you know two to three in the lifetime of a general population is happening two or three times a shift right right so you're you're 100 percent right um and i hate I, I know that we're up against the time um i want to thank you for having me today and uh i appreciate the opportunity and you keep doing what you're doing. Yeah, absolutely, Lieutenant. And you too. And 
And uh, if we can work it out, I'd love to have you back on because I think there's a whole lot more we can talk about. Because there's absolutely anytime. So, but I appreciate it. I'll uh, I'll put some of that stuff in the show notes. And uh, but yeah, I appreciate what you're doing, and thank you. My pleasure. Take care. Yes, sir. I appreciate you tuning in and listening to Critical Aspects of Law Enforcement. Remember to subscribe to the podcast and share this resource with your fellow officers. The goal of Critical Aspects is to serve, support, and sustain the law enforcement professionals. So head over to www.criticalaspects.org for more resources and information. And as always, God bless and be safe.